1927 in Hamadan, Iran, and passed away earlier this year in June of 2018. He taught at the University of Chicago from 1966 to 2010 and was therefore responsible for the training of many generations of students and in particular for conveying and inspiring them with his love of Iranian culture and particularly of Persian literature. A number of those students, those direct students in Persian literature include Michael Bailable, Michael Hillman, Paul Sprachman, Paul Lisinski, myself, Sunil Sharma, and Alyssa Gabai, but he was responsible for a slew of other uh, individuals who came through the University of Chicago and were not necessarily working directly on Persian, and the list is quite long, so I'm not going to read all of their names. But before he came to the United States, he also began his career teaching in Germany uh, with Johann Christoph Bergel, and in Italy with Angela Piemontese and Bianca Maria Scarcia Amoretti. So the lectureship in his honor is in part to celebrate the um, legacy of Persian studies that he contributed to um, in the United States as well as around the world. So the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations uh, which is the home for the lectureship, is very pleased and proud to welcome you to this inaugural lecture. Um, the choice of the speaker tonight would have been very much in Professor Moyad's good graces. Uh, he has come before I met him because Professor Moyad invited him in the early 1990s for a talk here, and we all at that point in time benefited from the expertise and the good humor of uh, Professor Dick Davis, who is our inaugural lecturer. Uh, Professor Davis was born at the end of the Second World War in England, and he did his BA and his MA at the Universities of Cambridge in English literature and his PhD in Manchester in medieval Persian. And the story is that he went first to Iran after finishing his uh, degrees in English literature, where he spent some time teaching at the University of Tehran and met, uh, met with the decision to uh, come back to the UK and do a PhD in Persian literature. He also met with his uh, wife and uh, has collaborated with her in some of his translations. After coming back to the UK, he taught at Durham and Newcastle, and then came to the United States where he taught at UCSB, and finally at Ohio State University where he was professor of Persian and chair of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures. He retired in 2012, but has remained extremely active both as an author and translator and editor, but also as a teacher visiting various universities where he has shared his knowledge and his love of Persian poetry and culture with students uh, around the United States. He's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature since 1981. Um, most of the Persian students will know him as the leading translator of Persian literature in our time, certainly into English, but I think into any uh, world literature. But he is not limited in his, uh, his scholarly output and or his cultural output to uh, translations from Persian literature. He has published quite a number of books. I think the total is 12 books of original poems, and very recently his collected poetry has come out. So he's now Sahib um, Divan. And uh, that's quite an accomplishment. Um, his first book was published in 1975, many of them with Anvil Press in London. And I won't read you all the names because we'll be here quite some time. But in addition to his translations of Persian, he has edited 
the selected writings of Thomas Traherne, the 17th century English poet. He's also done, it's not on his CV here, he's modestly omitted it, but he's done translations from Italian. And uh, his translations from Persian include works that many of you know, including The Conference of the Birds, The Robayat of Omar Khayyam, uh, The Shahnameh, uh, My Uncle Napoleon, um, Borrowed Ware, which is a collection of medieval Persian epigrams, uh, Vis and Ramin, uh, Hafez and the poets of Shiraz, including Jahan Malik Khatun and Obeid Zakani, and uh, When They Broke Down the Door, which is a collection of translations by the contemporary poet Fatime Shams. Uh, in addition to these works of translation, he has contributed two really seminal works of scholarship for Persian literary studies, and those are his epic and sedition, The Case of Ferdowsi's Shah Nameh, which is an astounding piece of scholarship, but it's also an extremely beautifully written piece of academic writing that uh, one wishes to, but never quite seems to be able to emulate. And also, Panthea's Children, Hellenistic Novels and Medieval Persian Romances, uh, which is a, an extremely important contribution to the history of Persian romances and their connection to the late antique uh, Greek novel. So before I call him up here, I want to do something that may surprise him a little bit, and that is to say that I'm very pleased on behalf of uh, Asghar Sayed Ghorab of the University of Leiden to present Professor Davis with a festschrift of articles that I think he doesn't know about um, from 22 scholars at 13 different universities. Um, and the book is here. It's just arrived. So I am pleased to be able to show it to him for the first time and to congratulate him. This is called The Layered Heart, Essays on Persian Poetry, edited by Asghar Sayed Gorab, uh, a celebration in honor of Dick Davis. So, Professor Davis. And he is going to talk to us about uh, She Can't Be Kept Locked Up, um, medieval, forgotten medieval Persian women poets. OK. Thank you, Frank. I'll put this in my pocket. Can you hear me? Is my voice coming through all right? OK. Well, I'm rather overwhelmed by all that. Thank you very much, Professor Lewis. It's extremely... I had, in fact, heard rumors of that. But <laughs> <laughs> about six different people said to me, you're not supposed to know about this, but... <laughs> but I didn't know it was out now. I thought it was, you know, sometime next year or something. Well, um, well thank you. And thank you. I know that you're, you, you contributed an article. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, it's a great honor. I really, I mean it very, very um, sincerely. It's a great honor to be chosen as the first person to speak in this series of lectures in honor of Professor Moyad. It is also a very great honor for me to give this talk um, in the presence of Mrs. Moyad. And thank you very much for being here. Um, I retired from teaching now. I retired in 2012. But when I was teaching Persian literature, um, it, it occurred to me at one point that I was probably the only non-Iranian uh, in the United States who was teaching Persian literature who was not taught by Professor Moriad. All, all the others <laughs> seem to have been taught by him. I, th I, I might have missed one or two, but I think that's generally true. He wasn't my teacher, but he was an inspiration to me. Um, he was, as people who knew him, he was a marvelous person, just as a person. But he was also, that is, he, he was kind, he was generous. He was a noble person. He had great nobility in his character. Um, and also, he was a great scholar. He, he took scholarship very seriously. 
He didn't compromise his scholarship. But he was very generous to young people like myself. When I started out, he was extremely kind to me. Um, you know, I was a little nothing, and he was a very big deal, and he was very good to me, and I was very grateful. So, um, as I say, it's a great honor for me to give this first talk um, in, the, in the series of lectures to, rem to remember him in his honor. The title of my talk today uh, refers to a poem which is ascribed to the 12th century poet Masati, who uh, I have an awful lot to say, and I'm, I hate it when I go to talks and people go on and on and on, and I, I think, why don't you shut up? So I'll try, I'll try not to go on too long. As a friend of mine once said, if Dante came around and talked for an hour, I, I would leave at some point. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try not to talk too much. But I might refer to Masati later on if there's time, but at, at the moment I'll just talk to, mention her in passing. The title of my talk today refers to a poem ascribed to the 12th century poet Masati, who is one of the few modern, pre-modern women poets whose name has not, in fact, been forgotten. And here is the poem from which I've taken my title in translation. An old man says, we must remain here. We can't be kept locked up. In this sad chamber racked with pain here, we can't be kept locked up. That woman whose tempestuous hair is like a wild beast's mane, stuck in the house, held by a chain here, we can't be kept locked up. Now, the poem, the, the phrase we can't be kept locked up, it implies that some people are locked up, but it, it also implies that they're not going to stand for it. And a lot of Persian, there's a great deal of, of, of poetry by Persian women, although they hardly um, figure at all in the standard anthologies. Between those two extremes, they are being locked up, or some of them, of course, not all, bit, and, they, and they can't stand for it. The poetry tends to sort of go between those two extremes, or tends to sort of hover between those, those, those two possibilities. I'm going to talk about four poets. Uh, Rabi'e, Jahan Malek Khatun, Mehri, and Mahfi. Now, it might be objected that Rabe'e, those of you in Persian studies, will know that Rabe'e, like Masati, has not been forgotten, in fact. So um, she's not a forgotten poet, but I think her importance has been radically underestimated. In fact, Rabe'e is always thought of as one of the first poets, Persian poets, uh, in the revival of Persian poetry, um, uh, which happens in the late 9th, early 10th century. Uh, and she's a contemporary of Rudaki, probably. It's always said that Rudaki mentions her, but I have never found a mention of her in Rudaki's work, and I've been through it fairly thoroughly looking for it. But it is said here and there that she's mentioned by Rudaki, but as I say, I haven't found it. But she's thought of as a, uh, as a contemporary of Rudaki, who is thought of as the first great poet in Persian. Um, uh, I think her importance is more than that, more than just being at the beginning. As I said, Rabia is one of the very first Persian poets, which might suggest that her poems would have a certain simplicity and directness. And superficially, this is true. They are not particularly elaborate in their rhetoric, and they are in the main easily paraphrasable. But Rabier's poems, they have a simplicity that hides a great deal of learning and sophistication. For example, she is, as far as we know, the first Persian poet who wrote macaronic verse, that is, verse that is written in two languages. The most famous medieval macaronic poems are probably the Spanish poems, which have Arabic refrains. There are also medieval macaronic poems in English, where you get alternate lines in, in English and Latin. They're, they're, they're quite common. But uh, Rabia seems to be the first person who writes these poems in Persian. Um, and in her case, the alternating lines are in Arabic and Persian. Now, if you look at the English poems that are macaronic poems, the Latin in them is usually taken from the liturgy of the Catholic Church. That is, it is Latin which would be in everybody's head. That is, the poet hasn't actually composed the lines. He's taken the lines. Rabi is uh, uh, Arabic poems. She has composed the lines. They're not lines she's taken from somewhere else. Or if she has, we don't know where they're taken from. They seem to be her lines. That is, she's not just repeating something parrot fashion. She is writing in Arabic. This implies fluency in Arabic, and what we know of her biography seems relevant here. Her name, Rabi'e, uh, in indicates an Arab origin at a time when the court language of most Persian princedoms, and her father was a local prince in Balkh, in northern Afghanistan, was in, most, was, in, was in the process of changing from Arabic to Persian. Uh, 
which means that she was almost certainly bilingual. Her father's name was Kab, and her own name, as it appears in early sources, is Rabi'e bint Kab. Her brother's name was Hares. All three names are clearly Arabic, and the family claimed descent from Arab immigrants who had established a petty kingdom centered on Balkh, which later became subservient to the Samanids, for whom Rudaki wrote. As we said, Rabia appears at the beginning of the revival of Persian poetry after the two centuries of silence, the phrase is Zarin Kubs, Sokut, that followed on from the Arab Islamic conquest of the seventh century. As long ago as the 18th century, the literary historian Thomas Wharton, he's writing about Europe, but it's applicable, I think, to this situation. The literary t historian Thomas Wharton pointed out that after a dark age in which learning is largely lost, at least in its native linguistic form, the revival of learning appears to have first owed its rise to translation. The writers are chiefly employed in imparting the ideas of other languages into their own. In the case of Rabier's general generation, the other language in question was obviously Arabic. The great Italian Persianist Alessandro Belsani wrote of this earliest period in the revival of Persian poetry, we are in the presence of a linguistic ironization of Arabic conceptual traditions and lyric conventions. The language still used to describe Persian poetry confirms its early debt to Arabic. Every single word descriptive of the rhetoric of Persian poetry, the words for rhyme, meter, metaphor, etc., etc., every single word is Arabic. And the form, and, and also the names of the forms of the poetry in Persian, they're all Arabic. Masnavi, Ghazal, Ghaside, Rubai, Ghate, etc. Let's consider Rabi'e's position. She grows up at a provincial court where we can presume she had access to whatever literary learning was available in her time and place, as is attested by her surviving poems. She is bilingual in Arabic and Persian, as her macaronic poems attest. She lives at a moment when Persian poetry is effecting a rebirth by, as Barsani says, a linguistic ironization of Arabic conceptual traditions and lyric conventions. And given the fact that she uses them, her familiarity with the rules and tropes of Arabic versification can be taken for granted. These circumstances place her as almost uniquely able to effect the transfer of Arabic poetic conventions and tropes to Persian verse, to which Bafsani refers. This suggests, I think, that Rabia was not merely a woman who happened to write verse at the moment when Persian poetry was being reborn but that her role in this revival was crucial and perhaps decisive. Her circumstances and achievement indicate that she was someone whose example made possible the revival of Persian poetry, on the, at least in terms of its major non-Persian model, which was Arabic poetry. Of course, I'm not at all suggesting that she was the only person who did this, or that she did this single-handed, handedly. But she was certainly in a privileged and qualified position to contribute to this process. And remember, she was a princess at a court. Princesses have a lot of clout, more clout than, than ordinary, than ordinary poets. So if this was something she was going to do, other people would be likely to imitate it. She deserve, and she deserves, I think, much greater credit than she is usually given for her role in the development of early Persian poetry. She was, I believe, an instigator, someone who pointed the way that Persian verse was to develop, rather than simply one of the small number of Persian poets who happened to be writing at this time and who happened to be a woman, which is how she has generally been perceived. So much, perhaps, for her role in the development of early Persian poetry. But before leaving Rabi'e, I'd like to draw attention to the ways in which her life became a kind of paradigm of the roles that Persian women poets who came after her often found themselves playing. To begin with, she was a court poet. Well, we may say, so were virtually all medieval Persian poets. But there is a crucial difference between her and almost all of her male counterparts. The men were professional poets dependent on the largesse of the prince or of the courtiers at the court at which they worked. Rabi'e was a princess, not a court employee, and as such I would suggest that it's unlikely she was paid for her poetry, or if she did receive some kind of emolument or reward for her poems, this was a kind of compliment. It wasn't something she depended on for her livelihood. So she is, in the strict sense of the word, an amateur poet. She's not somebody who, uh, who, she's somebody who writes poetry because she really wants to write poetry, not because she needs to write it to put bread on the table, as it were. Many of the women poets who followed in Rabia's footsteps were also princesses or aristocrats 
who were amateur, quotation marks, poets, in the sense that they were members of the, ro- of the ruling family and not employees of the ruling family. When we do find women poets later on who are employed by noble families, they were virtually never employed as poets. They were employed as other things. They were usually entertainers of some kind, sometimes courtesans, employed not for their poetry but for other skills and charms. Even Masati, the poet, the poet I quoted at the very beginning, even Masati, one of whose poems I've just quoted, a shadowy figure whose biography seems to be largely apocryphal, one scholar of Persian poetry actually suggested to me that he believed that uh, Masati never, never in fact existed, but we'll leave that aside. Many of whose supposed poems may or may not be by her, and who seems to be an exception to the rule that woman poets were virtually always amateurs, even Masati was employed at the, at the court of the Seljuk monarch King Sanjar, if she existed, not as a poet, but as a scribe. There is another way in which Rabe'e seems to stand as a kind of model, or rather a dreadful warning to the women poets who came after her. The lurid story of her death is well known to people interested in Persian poetry, but not perhaps to that beyond that group, so I will tell it briefly here. It is very grisly. <clears throat> While Rabi is far... It may not be true, of course, but um, nothing suggests it isn't. While Rabi A's father was alive, she seems to have been able to live more or less as she wished with at least a modicum of independence. This changed when her brother died, when, sorry, when her father died, and her brother, Hares, became king. Rabi'e was said to have been carrying on a secret love affair with a servant at the court. Hares found out about this, and in a fit of brotherly outrage at his besmirched honour, he cut his sister's throat and locked her in a bathhouse where she bled to death. Her servant lover then killed Hares and committed suicide. It's very grisly indeed. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that a lot of later women poets were killed by their brothers. <clears throat> but it's certainly true that a great deal of poetry written by women in Persian is, as it were, shadowed by a male presence that is both resented and feared. This is, this is very apparent. In, and at the moment, I'm putting together an anthology of, of uh, poems written by, by women poets. And this feeling of resentment and fear of the male is constant. It comes up in every generation virtually. As a kind of grisly coincidental footnote, I mean this is completely off subject, but it seems so so strange that I saw I throw it in. As a kind of grisly coincidental footnote, we can mention that the story of Rabi'e's death found an almost identical echo in 16th century Italy. The poet Isabella di Mora was said to be her father's favorite child, and she was able to live more or less as she wished while he was alive. After her father died, she fell in love with someone of whom her brothers disapproved, and she carried on a secret correspondence with him, which her brothers intercepted. They killed her lover, and they beat her to death. So we can say that the menacing, potentially murderous male presence behind a great deal of poetry written by women was not something restricted to Iran. The second of the poets, that's Rabi. The second of the poets I want to talk about this evening is Jahan Malek Khatun. And in fact, it was Jahan Malek Khatun that started me off on this anthology, which I'm trying to finish at the moment. Um, <clears throat> having written a, an essay some time ago explaining how it's quite impossible to translate Hafez's poems, I decided I would try and translate Hafez's poems. And um, the publisher was very keen that we do this. But then by that time, in 1995, the divan of this woman poet, um, Jahan Malek Khatun, was published. She was a contemporary of Hafez, and she lived in the same, uh, in the same town as, as Hafez, and in fact her uncle was Hafez's chief uh, uh, patron. Um, I don't want to go on, I can't, I can't go on about this too much, but the, the court was the Inju court. The, the, the Injus were partly descended from the Mongols. The Mongol courts were very open about, um, much more open than most Islamic courts of the period, about the presence of women in the court. The women were often not veiled in the court, uh, and they took part in, in court proceedings, and they, they even took part in discussions of politics and things like that. So I think it's quite likely that Jahan Malek Khatun knew Hafez. Hafez was the most famous poet of his period. Hafez was, was um, a poet who was patronized by her uncle, who also encouraged her poetry too. It's very unlikely, I think, that they didn't meet. 
There's also Obeda Zarkani, who is a poet of the same period and who also almost certainly knew Hafez. Um, and he's the most famous obscene poet in Persian. I don't think that uh, Jahan Khotun and he would get on very well. Um, he wrote two poems about her, which are extremely unpleasant. <clears throat> it's very surprising he kept his head, actually, after that, but he did. <clears throat> now, because of Jahan Khatun, I began to, th I thought, how many other women poets are there? Because really, if one looks in the anthologies, there are very few. Um, if you go from the beginning up to, uh, really up to the middle of the 19th century, there's very few indeed. So I started to look, and I asked around, including Professor Lewis, and I asked lots of other people too, um, do, you, do you know of any women poets? Do you know of any books I should look at? Do you know of any manuscripts I should try and get microfiche of? And so on and so forth. And within a couple of months, I had 800 pages of poems by women poets, most of them pre-modern, which I think is extraordinary, considering that virtually none of these poets or poems are mentioned in the standard anthologies. So it was Jahan Khatun who sort of started me off on this this uh, um, quest that I'm on at the moment. She lived in the 14th century. She's a, a, a contemporary of Hafez, um, and she lives in Shiraz. When Jahan, when Jahan Khatun was about 30, her uncle's reign came to an abrupt end. His army was defeated on the battlefield uh, by a warlord who then executed Jahan Khatun's uncle, uh, Hafez's patron, and he also executed all of her male relatives whom he could get his hands on. Some of her poems seem to indicate that she was imprisoned for a while and then exiled. <clears throat> Though we have to be very careful when treating lyric poetry as literal autobiography, as it usually owes much more to poetic conventions than to personal experience. However, some of Jahan Khatun's poems do seem to refer to particular personal experiences. Again, there's something technical one can say here. There is a particular form in Persian called the fragment, the khate, which was often used for autobiographical experiences. The ghazal, which is often read by Westerners as autobiographical, it, it, I think it virtually never is. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a form, and it's a completely conventional form. But the fragment form is, it does often seem to, 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 to contain autobiographical material. And a number of Jahan Khatun's frag fragments um, do indicate what probably happened to her after this warlord um, killed her uncle and took over the rule of Shiraz. Five years after her uncle, uh, uncle's defeat, the son of the new ruler deposed his father and welcomed back to Shiraz the poets who had been exiled or fled. And it seems that Jahan Khatun came back to Shiraz and lived out the rest of her life there. The, there we have two other pieces of information about her. One is that she married her uncle's Nadim, that is his bosom buddy, his best friend, his drinking companion, etc. And again, she has many love poems. Most of her poems, in fact, are love poems. But there is a distinctive note in some of her love poems, which is not um, a convention of, of the genre, which is in, in the, in the, the Ghazal genre, uh, genre uh, wine is always praised, particularly at this time. Wine is a good thing. It brings happiness it, um, and so on and so forth. Jahan Khatun is very iffy about wine, and she more than once says in her poems she doesn't like a lover who is drunk. I think there's probably something autobiographical there, particularly as the man she married was her, was her uncle's drinking buddy. <clears throat> she thinks, oh my God, he's come home drunk again. <laughs> um, okay. So she married her uncle's Nadim, and that, if, if we can believe at any of her, uh, her love poems, that wasn't a happy marriage. It, it might be convention. Unhappy love poems are completely conventional for this period, but they do sound, sometimes they do sound very personal. The other thing we know about her is that she had a, a daughter who died at a very young age. We can tell from the, she wrote 23 elegies to this daughter. 23 elegies, she, it clearly, got to her. It was very, it's, it's clearly a very important moment in her life, event in her life, the loss of her daughter. And those poems, I think the, the personal feeling in those poems is undeniable. It's not conventional. It's very, it's very strong and very moving, I feel. Uh, and I'll read a couple of them later. I'm going to read a few of her poems in translation. Now, her divan is quite expensive, extensive. It's three times as long as that of Hafez, for example, her Shirazi contemporary. 
Uh, and it's mostly ghazals, but also a couple of praise poems, a number of rubaiyats, the elegies on her daughter that I, that I mentioned, and the fragments I mentioned. She is in many ways, and I think this is really because we have so many of her poems. We've got her complete divan. We've got 1,500 poems by her. Um, uh, she is, I think, the most accomplished, significant, and to my mind, interesting pre-19th century woman poet who wrote in Persian, perhaps after Rabi. But we have far fewer poems by Rabi than we do by Jahan Khatun. I'm going to read a few of her poems in translation, uh, and most of what I'm going to do from now on is read translations. Um, towards this anthology which I'm working on. Now, some of her poems are very playful, particularly when she's... Uh, she, she has playful poems about love and she has very sad poems about love. The short ones tend to be playful, the longer ones are sad. Uh, I, I'll read some of the shorter ones. I swore I'd never look at him again. I'd be a Sufi, deaf to sin's temptations. I saw my nature wouldn't stand for it. From now on, I renounce renunciations. Last night, my love, my life, you lay with me. I grasped your pretty chin. I fondled it. And then I bit and bit your sweet lips till I woke. It was my fingertip I bit. And a slightly sadder one. I think a lot of people can identify with this poem, especially when you're young. <clears throat> Of course, I'm immensely old and don't identify at all. <clears throat> Always, whatever else you do, my heart, try to be kind, try to be true, my heart. And if he's faithless, all may yet be well. Who knows what he might do? Not you, my heart. I'm going to read one of the poems which is almost certainly autobiographical, and it's the kind of poem that one could almost imagine it written in this century, or the previous century, in the 20th century, after some terrible civil upheaval, a war or something like that. It's a poem which seems to describe her after the warlord conquered Shiraz and her family were killed. She was captured and she's in a school. She's obviously been put in a school. She says the school is in ruins. The, the town has been fought over. She's in this ruined school and her captors are in the next room discussing what to do with her. It's a quite extraordinary poem and it's really not a conventional poem in that sense. It, it feels you feel a very strong individual situation and you feel her resignation and fear together. Here in the corner of a ruined school, more ruined even than my heart, I wait while men declare that there's no goodness in me. I sit alone and brood upon my fate and hear their words like salt rubbed in my wounds and tell myself I must accept my state. I don't want wealth. And I don't envy them the ostentatious splendor of the great. What do they want from me, though, since I've nothing, now that I'm destitute and desolate? Another poem that almost certainly comes out of the violent um, political events that happened when she was around 30 years old. It's a, it's a kind of lament to heaven. Um, it mentions in the middle, in the middle of the poem, it mentions a cut down cypress tree. I'm virtually certain the cut down cypress tree refers to her uncle who has been executed. How long will heaven's heartless tyranny which keeps both rich and poor in agony go on? The dreadful happenings of these times have torn up by the roots hope's noble tree and in the garden of the world you'd say they've stripped the leaves as far as one can see. That cypress which was once the sinusure of souls they've toppled ignominiously. I cry to heaven above Again I cry, how long will this injustice fall on me? What can I tell my grieving heart that won't let dearest friends assuage its misery? You'd say heaven stuffed its ears with scraps of cotton simply to show that it's ignoring me. That image at the end of the poem, you'd say heaven stuffed its ears with scraps of cotton. Most images in medieval Persian poems are, they come from a stock which all poets use. Originality of imagery is not something that's especially pr prized. I haven't come across that image elsewhere. I might be wrong. But as far as I know, it's, it's original to Jahan Khatun. You'd say heaven's ears has stuffed its ears with scraps of cotton. Another poem that also seems to come out of this political turmoil in the middle of her, her life. Um, this is a poem which does something that a lot of contemporary poets for Jahan Khatun did, especially Hafez, but which she rarely does. But in this poem, she does do it, which is when you, as you're growing, getting towards the end of the poem, she suddenly seems to change the subject completely. 
she sort of swerves off to something else. And she suddenly talks about a you. Having been talking about people in general, she suddenly refers the poem to a you. And the you is clearly God. Most people in the world want power and money. And just these two. That's all they're looking for. They're faithless, callous, and unkind. The times are filled with squabbles, insurrection, war. And everyone puts caution first, since now few friends exist of whom one can be sure. Men flee from one another like scared deer, and for a bit of bread the rabble roar as though they'd tear each other's guts apart. And why are men determined to ignore the turning of the heavens, which must mean the world will change, as it has done before? But in their souls they are your slaves, and search the meadows for the cypress they adore. My heart's an untamed doe who haunts your hills and whom no noose has ever snared before. That last um, line, the, the two lines in the English, that last line is extremely beautiful in Persian. My heart's an untamed doe who haunts your hills and whom no noose has ever snared before. Well, I won't comment further on it. <clears throat> I'll read you one of her love poems. Um, she has an awful lot of love poems. This is a fairly typical one. It's complaining to her lover, maybe her husband, maybe an imaginary lover. I have a feeling it was her husband. Um, uh, one thing that is very common in Persian love poems, or in Persian poems generally, but particularly in love poems, is that a contradist contradistinction which what, with what you might expect in an English poem, if you have an English poem in which somebody is referred to as you, and somebody is referred to as he, you assume that, you would assume, I think, that they're two different people. In a Persian poem, they're almost always the same person. And that's the case here. They're not always the same person, but usually they are. Here we have a, 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 a first the person is referred to in the third person uh, as a he, and then later on in the poem, it's re he's referred to as you. But they're both the same person. This is fairly typical of her love poems, of which there are an awful lot. My friend who was so kind and faithful once has changed his mind now, and I don't know why. I think it must be in my wretched stars. He feels no pity for me when I cry. Oh, I complain of your cruel absence, but your coming here is like dawn's breeze in the sky. That oath you swore to and then broke, thank God it's you who swore and is forsworn, not I. I didn't catch, sorry, I didn't snatch one jot of joy before you snatched your clothes from me and said goodbye. I didn't thank you, since I wasn't sure you'd really been with me or just passed by. How envious our clothes were when we lay without them, clasped together, you and I. That's nice, isn't it? Your curls have chained my heart up. This is right. Madmen are chained up as they rage and sigh. They say the world's Lord cherishes his slaves. So why is he harsh to me? I don't know why. The world's Lord, there's a pun there. Her name, Jahan Khatun, Jahan, as those of you who know Persian will know, Jahan means world. So she's talking about herself. The world's Lord, Jahan's Lord, my Lord. Of course, the world's Lord is God. So she's implying that this man she feels all this about is like God to her. <clears throat> I'm going to read a couple of her elegies to her daughter, and then I'll pass on to another poet. Um, these elegies are really very moving in, in, in Persian. I'll, I'll read a, a longish one, and then I'll read just a short... It's just over... It's, it, it's, it's about a page. And then I'll read one that's just four lines in English, two lines in Persian. Um, usually, in, when I translate Persian poetry, I try to keep the same form as far as possible. Sometimes it's not possible. You might have noticed that a lot of these poems have monorhyme. That is, the same, the same rhyme sound through the whole, through the whole poem. Sometimes... This just comes, and it is possible, but sometimes it's not possible. And with this poem, though it is in monorhyme in the original, I tried to do it in monorhyme in English, and I just gave up. I realized that I couldn't do it and keep it close to the, to the, to the um, meaning of the Persian, uh, and also the feel of the Persian. So I've, given, I've done uh, separate rhymes for each stanza. But it would be one rhyme right through in Persian. The you in this poem is her daughter who died apparently when she was two or three years old. That's what the poems seem to indicate. In one of the poems, she talks about her just beginning to speak. <clears throat> your heart a rose bush, and your soul a cypress, sweet pleasure's bud, fruit worthy of the spirit. And I, a mother now, without her child, denied life's joy, and all life should inherit. How men loved seeing what they'd never seen, till, like a fairy's child, she slipped from sight. Don't criticize me when I weep, 
But think how Jacob wept for Joseph day and night. What wound is this whose only balm is tears? What pain whose cures lamenting and distress? I weep a flowing river, and Oman has never seen these pearls that soak my dress. While I have eyes within my head and while my tongue is in my mouth, I'll always see her image in my eyes, and by my tongue her name will be repeated constantly. This grief so scorch my heart that when I'm dust, that dust will show my sorrow all too well. My house that was a shining paradise is darker now than any dungeon cell. My heart was like a home that welcomed pleasure. Now only grief comes knocking at its door. My suffering heart has borne so much it's like a storm-tossed boat that cannot reach the shore. Prepare to quit this wretched hovel here. When autumn comes, the nightingales are leaving. It's fate that heaps these sorrows on our heads. You can't say times to blame when you are grieving. The wretched hovel is the world. This is a cliche for the world at, at this period. It's not just Johan cartoons. You can't say times to blame when you are grieving. She says it's fate that heaps these sorrows on our heads. What it means is that this, my loss of this child was fated from the beginning. That it's not something that happens in the passing of time. It's always been there, as it were, waiting to happen to me. A, a, a short poem about the death of her daughter too. <clears throat> this mentions Resban, who is the angel who guards paradise. Um, uh, he, he's a bit like, um, he has the role of St. Peter, as it were. He admits you or doesn't admit you into paradise, St. Peter in the Christian tradition. And she's talking about her, her daughter, who she calls a rose here. It's, it's only four lines in English. My heart's new rose was snatched from me, and grief replaced her, given by the hand of fate. But then my eyes saw Resvan's kindness when, as she approached, he opened heaven's gate. So she sees her go into paradise in her mind. Okay, the next point I'm going to talk about is Mehri. Now, Mehri is a really feisty poet. She's certainly one of those poets who you feel can't be kept locked up. Um, she's bawdy, she's cheeky, she's angry, she's quite a lady. Um... She's, she's from the end of the 14th, beginning of the 15th century. She was an intimate of the Timurid princess Gohar Shod, who lived from 1378 to 1457, and she was the consort of the Timurid emperor Sharok, who was one of the major patrons of the arts of his time and the ruler of the eastern Timurid empire, which stretched from Herat to Samarkand. When Sharok died in 1447, Gohar Shod, who was by this time nearly 70, became the de facto ruler of her husband's empire. Both while she was her husband's consort and after his death, Gohashad maintained her own highly accomplished and independent and largely female court, of which this person, this poet, Mehri, was a prominent member. Mehri was married off at a young age to a court doctor, who was much older than she was, and a lot of her poems complain about this. Her poems' occasional sexual frankness, some of them are really frank, her poem's occasional sexual frankness and their relative openness about unsatisfactory husbands, especially unsatisfactory husbands in bed, suggests that they were written for an audience mainly of women, most likely Gohar Shad's numerous female courtiers. Some poems seem to imply that she had a lover or two, but this may be no more than convention, and it may not, of course. She may have had a lover or two. The frequent feistiness of her verses can be similar to some of those shown by Jahan Khatun in a number of her poems. And since the two poets' lives probably overlapped by a few years, Jahan's poems may still have been in circulation during Mehri's lifetime. As a court ruled by an empress such as that which employed Mehri would be, like, would be a likely place for a princess's poems to be valued, it seems a reasonable assumption that Mehri was perhaps familiar with at least some of Jahan's work. One of the Forms of, not, not form, the form is the wrong, wrong word. One of the, one of the tones that, one of the things that Persian poetry likes to do, particularly the very short poems. A lot of very short poems in, in the, in the early, um, medieval period, they are put down poems. They're poems which make fun of somebody, which dismiss somebody, which tell somebody that they're useless or a pain in the neck or go away, and so, so, so forth. And Mehri is particularly good at these put down poems. There's a famous put-down poem, well, it's not that, but there's a poem, there's a put-down poem, a very short poem, it's only a fragment, in fact, it's obviously part of a longer poem that's been lost, by Rudaki, the poet who's contemporary with Rabbe, the first poet. 
Uh, and the, the English of this, you have to think about this for a moment. You think, what the hell does that mean? And then you see what it means. The English of this goes, have you seen a fish catch a pigeon? Your sword is the fish. Your enemy is the pigeon. Got it? All right. Never mind. <laughs> okay, here's, here's Mehri's poems. Between us now, this is to her husband. Between us now, I feel there's no connection left. No loyalty or kindness or affection left. You've grown so abject and so old, you haven't got the feeble strength to manage an erection left. <laughs> I wouldn't have an argument with her. <laughs> In is another one to her husband. In your distinguished house, the thing I thought to have, it isn't there. The freedom my distracted spirit thought to have, it isn't there. You say, I've everything. I've untold wealth and luxury. Oh, yes, there's everything. But what I ought to have, it isn't there. <coughs> a young girl married to a man who's old will find, till she's old, happiness denied her. Better an arrow pierce her side, they say, than have a husband who is old beside her. And here's perhaps the most angry one of all. <coughs> we sleep together. This is to her husband. We sleep together and you never satisfy me. I talk to you at night. Your silences defy me. I'm thirsty and you claim that you're the fount of life. For God's sake, where's the water then that you deny me? <laughs> an answer to an old man who proposed himself as her lover. Good God, what do you think my flesh is? What? It's handsome men, I fancy, young and hot. If I liked weak old men, why would I whine about the one that I've already got? <laughs> <clears throat> and the next one is very bawdy, and I will just read it and pass on and say nothing about it. When I first read this poem, I thought, can that possibly mean what it seems to mean? <laughs> and, I real and I just checked with my wife, who's Iranian, and she said, yes, Dick, that's what it means. <clears throat> it's very short. It's only two lines. He asked if he might kiss my lips, although not which lips. Those above or those below. No night is shorter than a night that's spent with you, since as you draw aside your veil, the sun shines through. If I had known to draw my skirts back from an old man's grasp, sorrow would not have grabbed youth's collar and undone its clasp. Old men are cautious with themselves. She's obviously talking about her husband again. Old men are cautious with themselves. The young are more, who cares? It's older buildings that require continual repairs. <laughs> and there's a very touching one here. I like to think that this is to a real lover, but it might just be a conventional thing. It's, very, it's only two lines. Put up your tousled hair that hides your features from my sight. Give me my first glimpse of the dawn in place of this dark night. The dark night, of course, would be the hair, because hair is always black in the Middle East. The last poet I'm going to talk about is Mahfi. Now, she's much later than the other poems, poets. She lived from 1637 to 1702. Her real name was Zib al-Nisa, and she was the daughter of the Mughal emperor Aurangzeb. Now, the pseudonym Mahfi is said to have been a common pseudonym which was used by women poets at the Mughal court. In particular, it's said to have been the, uh, the pseudonym of the Empress Nur Jahan, who wrote poetry too who was about a hundred years before Mahfi. Um, I, th I read all, that, all, the, all the poems by Noor Jahan that, are, that exist, and in none of them does she refer to herself as Mahfi. Still, that's what the, that's what the, um, the books on, on Jah Noor Jahan and so forth say about her. But this is a Mahfi who is the daughter of Aurangzeb, and she's the most famous of these people who call themselves Mahfi. At one time, she was engaged, I, I, just in case anybody doesn't know this, the Mughal court in India, which ruled from the 16th century really really into the 19th century, at, at least nominally, the court language of the Mughal court was Persian. For complicated reasons we needn't go into, but it was Persian. Um, she was At one time she was engaged to the son of Dara Shukoh, who was the translator of the Upanishads into Persian. Though whether he actually did the translating himself, which seems to be implied, or commissioned the translation is unclear. But this guy, Dara Shukoh, is a very interesting prince. He, he wanted to find some reconciliation between Hinduism and, and Islam, as his great-grandfather Akbar had also wanted to do. And he clearly either commissioned, 
I mean, the books say he did it himself, but I can hardly believe it. It would be an immense amount of work. Um, trans translating the Upanishads into Persian uh, was obviously part of this, this um, aim he had of uniting the disparate parts of the kingdom, or the disparate religions at least. But he, she, Now, she was engaged to Darashukoh's son for a while, but the marriage never took place. And it almost certainly didn't took place because, take place because of the opposition of her father, Aurangzeb, who had little love for Darashukoh. Darashukoh was Aurangzeb's older brother, and he was the legitimate heir to the Mughal throne. Darashukoh was. But Aurangzeb rose in rebellion against him and killed him, had him killed, and Aurangzeb became emperor instead. So she was engaged to this man's son, who was clearly the wrong person, according to her father. For 20 years, she was kept under house arrest on the orders of her father in the Salimgar fort in Delhi. She never married, although stories that may or may not be true circulated about various clandestine affairs. A um, couple of very short poems by her. The first one mentions the Kaaba, which I think most people will know here what it is, but just in case you don't, the Kaaba is the, the black stone at the center, at the geographical center of Islam, around which um, uh, pilgrims perambulate. Um, and the Kaaba, according to Islamic tradition, was made by Abraham, by Ibrahim, or put there by Abraham. This is only two lines. She says, My heart circle the heart, which is the hidden Kaaba. That Kaaba was made by Abraham, this one by God. <clears throat> Another tiny one. She was she was famous for her shyness, uh, um, and this one, this poem, sort of uh, it indicates that. I flee from knowing others so much that even before a mirror, my eyes stay shut. Now, her po the most famous of her poems are. She wasn't the only person who did this. It was fairly common. Poems that were exchanged between people for various social reasons, sometimes between lovers or would-be lovers. Um, if you know the, the, the Japanese novel, the um, 11th century novel, The Tale of Genji, almost every social occasion uh, is, is preluded by poems exchanged between the relevant people. This is a, a similar kind of thing. Now, there was the, the women of um, the Mughal court had much more freedom than the women of Iran by this time. We've forgotten the Injus, we've moved, we've moved into the Safavids. Um, and uh, the women would appear at court celebrations. They, they, were, they were not veiled at these big celebrations. There was a governor of Lahore called Agel Khan, and he was, so, he was so smitten with Mahfi, who he saw at one of these great celebrations, that he sent her this poem. So this is not by Mahfi, it's by Agel Khan, trying his luck with Mahfi, as it were. I'll be your nightingale if I should see you in the garden. With others there, I'll be your fluttering moth if I should see you, showing yourself to be the shining light of an assembly. Well, that's no good to me. It's in your shift I want to see you. Shift, slip, nightgown, something like that. Macfee sent back this answer. The nightingale forsakes the rose to see me in the garden. The pious Brahmin will forsake his idols when he sees me. I'm hidden in my words like scent within a rose's petal. Whoever wants to see me, it's in my words he'll see me. There's another exchange between Agal Khan and Mahfi. And again, Agal Khan is pushing his luck by being a bit risque, and Mahfi is fending him off. And this time, she fends him off with an implied insult. Two lines each. Agal Khan, what feeds on nothing and will rise and standing vomits and then dies? Magfi, women provoke this thing to stir. Your mother's sure to know. Ask her. <laughs> that's really rude, you know. <laughs> in, in that kind of society, it's, that's profoundly rude. <clears throat> okay, one more exchange between them. Um, this time, the exchange is initiated by Mahfi herself. She refers to Lely and Majnun. I think most of us know who Lely and Majnun are, but, but if we don't, they're, they're, they're sort of the classic Romeo and Juliet lovers of, of Islamic culture. Um, in terms of the way that Mahfi uses Lely and Majnun, Lely is the kind of passive one who, who just sort of sits around and weeps and moans and cries, etc. And Majnun goes off into the desert, sort of, um, and tears his hair out and, and becomes a madman uh, because of his unrequited love for Lely. 
Um, the, the actual poem is more complicated than that, but that's how she treats them. Okay, this is, this is um, Mahfi speaking. Although my sensibility is like Lely's, my heart is like Majnun's and wants to roam. I think of wandering in the wilderness, but shame's the chain that keeps me here at home. And Argel Khan thinks, ah, possible. Argel Khan says, when love is young and new and innocent, it's very true, shame might restrain it. But when it's grown up, wild and confident, what shame or modesty could chain it? McAfee isn't having it. <clears throat> Pure-minded folk are always circumspect, and shame will keep them modest and discreet. But when a bird's as shameless as you are, what shame could ever claim to chain its feet? Okay, I'll read three more short poems by McAfee. Um, o Waterfall, why do you groan incessantly? Who's made your forehead frown like this in agony? What dreadful pain is it that makes you constantly batter your head against a stone and weep like me? The next poem refers to stone and glass. Stone and glass in Persian poetry are like um, water and oil or, or um, chalk and cheese. They're, they're sort of opposites, with the added um, factor that stone, of course, can break glass. I'm upset with my heart, and with me she's the same. We're stone and glass, and I'm to blame, and she's to blame. When, Makfi, shall I reach the dwelling of my friend? The road ahead of me is dark. My horse is lame. The friend there almost certainly means God. The last poem I'll read of hers, uh, and, the, and uh, the last poem I'll read altogether. No shoot of joyful green grew from my being's soil. My thirst was never quenched by happiness's wine. The precious springtime of my life was spent in searching. For all my efforts, though, no wedding dress was mine. Thank you. If there are any questions, I'll attempt to answer them. <coughs> well, that's good. I mean, <laughs> seriously, are there any? Yes? I was curious, um, and I don't know, it might be hard to tell because I know you mentioned several times there's a biography convention and uh, autobiography. But one of the poems, I think it's the third woman, Mehri. Uh, Mehri, yes. Mehri, um, she had an image of her and her asking her lover to put their hair up. Yes. Um, and you also mentioned that she was a close companion of. Uh, yes. Do you know, are there any hints in terms of the way these female authors talk about gender that um, they were, I don't know, like, what the, the dynamic is there? The, the, uh, how long have we got? <laughs> <laughs> um, th th this is a very good question and it has a huge answer and in fact I didn't, I didn't sort of stray into that because I thought it would take up the whole talk. Jahan Khartoun, for example, uh, not the poet, poet you asked about, but who I'll come to. Jahan Khartoun, often, uh, many of her love poems, she refers to herself as the man. And she refers to the, p p the woman, the person we assume is the man to whom the, the love poems are addressed as the woman, which is a very strange reversal. It's, it, the, 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 the analogy that, I, that always occurs to me with these poems is, it's like Shakespeare's plays where women's parts were taken by boys and then in the play, uh, they were boys, but they were boys who were described as women, whereas they really were women. Um, and Jahan Khartoun's, she is a woman pretending to be a man, but she takes on womanly characteristics as a man, and she really is a woman. So th it's the same kind of thing. There is Gender is very subtle and nuanced in these women's poets. There's another point I didn't make, um, again, because I thought it would sort of lead us off into a completely different talk. The assumption in, Persian, in the Persian Ghazal, which is the love poem, uh, the assumption is that, the basic assumption is that the, the Ghazal is a homoerotic poem. It's a poem by a, a man to a, an adolescent. Uh, so it's by, it's male to male. Now, um, I don't think, certainly all, it's complicated. All Persian love poems are not male to male. It's clear. Um, and the fact that in Persian, Gender is not indicated by pronoun. There are very few words in Persian, except some borrowings from Arabic, that indicate gender. So you can write a poem, and it's, it's completely unclear what gender you're talking about. The assumption, the fallback assumption, is it's a male. But it might not be. It might be a woman. When I translated Hafez, I tried to do sort of half and half, but it's completely arbitrary. 
except just occasionally, sometimes, you have either a girl's breasts are mentioned or a boy's moustache is mentioned, something like that. But usually it's completely arbitrary. Now, when we have women writing these poems, our assumption is that they are written to men. But they may not be, in fact. They may also be, some of them, homoerotic poems, like the male poems are homoerotic poems. And some of, for example, Mehri's poems, she clearly didn't like her husband much, and she has these poems about removing a veil, for example. That sounds like a woman, but women didn't veil themselves before other women. But we don't, we don't know. There is a suggestion in some poems that uh, we're talking about um, a homoerotic relationship rather than a, um, a, a male-female relationship. I don't think that answers your question. Can, can, can you? Is, does that say more or less what you wanted? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes. What about God? Is there no mystical kind of love like there is in some of the? That is interesting. I I would have thought I would have expected that um, because women were relatively powerless in this kind of society and powerless people they do turn to, tend to turn to God. Um, Jahan Khartoun in some of her poems turns to God. Uh, and a, a, a number of Jahan Khartoun's poems say, the world has treated me so wretchedly and all my friends have betrayed me. I put my trust in God and nobody else. But it's not done in a particular mystical way. It's, it seems like sort of fairly orthodox Islam. And also she makes fun of Sufism occasionally. The very first poem I read by her says, um, I'd be a Sufi. And then she says, no, I can't do it. I'm not going to be a Sufi. Um, it's too difficult. <clears throat> Most of these, you don't, there are um, um, some poets, women poets, who wrote mystical uh, poetry, but there are far fewer of them than I expected to find, for example, and they are mostly much later. They're mostly 18th, 19th century. Uh, but uh, from this period, the period that I've just read poems from, virtually no one that I'm aware of, that I've come across. Yes. Yeah, it is often mentioned in the history of uh, Persian poetry that uh, female Persian poets, um, the pre-modern ones, mm -hmm. basically emulate the male aesthetics of the male poetry, mm -hmm. and they don't really get much into the detail sensuality mm -hmm. from the female perspective until Kurovatai was up, who is modern. Mm -hmm. And uh, even a time in the same <coughs> yeah, sure. Poetry. Are you saying that's wrong? Basically? Yeah, I'm saying that's wrong. Um, the the medieval, <laughs> in fact, um, um, medieval medieval Persian women poetry poets. And I, I want to make a distinction: a, a distinction between being bawdy and being obscene. A lot of obscene poetry is written by men in the medieval period. And the most famous poet, of course, is, is Obeid Zarkhani, whose poems are filthy, or some of them are filthy, not all of them, but some of them are filthy. Women don't write obscene poems, but they write bawdy poems. The difference is that they joke about sex. And a lot, of, there are a lot of uh, medieval women who joke about sex. They make fun of it. They make fun about husbands who can't sleep with them. Like, that kind of thing. They, uh, they laugh about it. They joke about having lovers, or wanting lovers, or what lovers might do to them. It's, it's a pri it's, it's private, um, and it's not, a lot of obscene poetry in Persian, it has a, it has an edge of anger in it. That, but that's male poetry. The female poetry doesn't. It jokes about. I mean, you can, you can imagine that Mehri with her useless husband is very angry with him. But her poems are not full of anger. They're full of contempt. They're, they're full of laughing contempt. She's, she's sneering at him. You're useless, you silly old fool. That, there's that feeling in them. And a, a number of these, um, early, um, earlier women poets in the medieval period, they're just as sensual as Farouk Faraksad with the difference that they, 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 they joke about it. They, they, they're light-hearted about it. I can give a, a um, I can give a, 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 a nice example of this. There is throughout the whole of Persian poetry, uh, and we've just seen Mehri as an example. The, the, the whole of Persian women's poetry, the, the 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 subject of old men marrying young women comes up again and again and again. It comes up all the time. In the early poets, it's it's treated from the point of view of the woman who is married to this older man, and, and she is laughing at him. So there is, there is anger in the poem. I've been married off to this, oh, this guy I can't stand. But she, she makes a joke about, uh, about it. She doesn't sit, there are, there are no tears. There's, there's laughter. She's sneering at him. In modern poets, there's a poem by Farooq Faraksad. There's uh, a poem by uh, Alam Taj. There's a poem by an Afghani poet called Barlas. These poets, they talk about the same subject, the marrying off of young women to old men, but they don't choose that moment when, when you have the, the middle-aged woman laughing at her husband. They choose the moment when the girl is being married, and the poem is, is tragic. The feeling in the poem is, is the, the most appalling thing is going to happen to this girl, and she doesn't know what, 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 what she's in for. 
It's a completely di- the subject is the same, but the feeling is quite different. <coughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, sources that you use. Sure. Um, the biographies or the anthologies that mm-hmm. talk about the life of the dreamer. Yeah. Um, the information is coming from the poem, or like there are documents of some other how. For example, like they were talking about uh, Jahanamari Khatun who lost a daughter. Mm-hmm. Is it something that they got it from the poem, or no? It's it's a bit of each. In the case of Jahan Malik Khatun's poems for her daughter. That is taken from the poems. In fact, originally when people found these poems, they first of all assumed they were poems for a lover. And then it became clear from details in the poems that they weren't about a lover at all. Then the po- a couple of the poems name the, the person who has died, Sultan Bakht. Sultan Bakht was the name of Jahan Khatun's stepmother. And it was assumed that they might be <laughs> poems uh, about about Sultan Bak, her stepmother, who, who perhaps died, when, uh, and, and who was supposed to have been close to Jahan Khatun. Can I, uh, can I just finish? But and but finally, the the details of the poem that she's a little girl, that she's just beginning to talk, and the way that um, uh, uh, Jahan Khatun talks about her as an, as an opening bud or an unopened bud, it's clear she's talking about a baby. And she's saying it's my baby. So that comes from the poem itself. In other cases, they come from the you will know that the tazkires, the the uh, the biographical notices about, about poets. Where their information comes from, we don't know. Mm, my question is: Do you think there is a possibility of the convention of creating this baby for the poets? It's a little bit. It just came to my mind. It's just a little bit uh, strange that all these male poets had a son who lost in the uh, early ages, mm-hmm. like Nazami and Khawani. Yeah. And, and Ferdosi, like, yes. For the female poets. Maybe yeah. isn't it a combination of writing poetry just making it? I'm pretty sure in Jahan Khatun's, in, in the, in the cases, I, I can think of, uh, I think four of these women who write about, uh, the loss of a child. Jahan Khatun's the only one I'm aware of who writes about a very little child. There are a couple of women who write about sons who died in battle. Uh, there's a, um, um, there's an, there's a poet of the 18th century called Aisha Afghani. And her, her son, she has a wonderful lament for her son killed in battle. It's very moving. That's clearly real. Um, well, it, to me, I feel it's clearly real. Um, uh, I, I don't think it's a, you can say that women write a lot of elegies. There's, a, there are, there are quite a few elegies written by Ghajar princesses. Um, you know, the, the Ghajar court was enormous and there were an awful lot of women and an awful lot of babies and a lot of them died. So that there, presumably. So, so there, there are, there are a number of poems by Ghajar princesses about, about dying, um, um, children. But I, I feel, you might be right, but I don't feel it's a convention, but it's just a feeling. I can't prove it. <coughs> Anything else? Okay, let's, um, give it up. Yes? You want to, you have another question. <laughs> so all the translations that you they, like you read, it's all yours. Yes. Is there any other like if I want to read about this woman in English, is there any biographical book or any sources that I can find them? No, not in English. Okay. You're, no, uh, you're going to have to read my introduction when it comes out. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to include the Persian? Well, the um, uh, this book, which is the book that has Jahan Khatun in. The, the publisher published the Persian separately. Um, it's, it's, where is it? Um, it's here. This book has the Persian of these poems. Uh, there's a couple of mistakes, actually, in fact, in that we, um, it, it was my fault. I didn't proofread carefully enough. Uh, there are three poems, I think, by Hafez in which we printed not the version I had translated from, from, but another version. So the lines are in different orders, but basically it's the same. Um, the, the, the publisher is interested in doing this, he says, because so many of these poems are completely unknown. Uh, and so it would be a service for Persian speakers, too, because otherwise, you know, it's very difficult to find these <coughs> poems. So uh, the, the, the aim is to do this. Um, whether it happens or not, I don't know. Who is the publisher? It's going to be published by uh, Mage Publishers, who publish all my translations first off. Mage has a, um, an agreement with uh, Penguin um, Classics, that they have first refusal on my translations. We hope Penguin Classics will do it too, but they might not. I don't, we have to offer it to them and see, see if they want it or not. Obviously, if Penguin Classics do it, do it it'll be, have much wider 
um, distrib distribution. Mage will do a nice hardback, uh, which will be expensive. And uh, I hope Penguin, but they may not. They, as I say, they have first refusal. They haven't refused one yet, but there's always a first. <coughs> yes? Sure. Yeah. Um, how many of them have their own design versus how many of them uh, an anthology drawing from earlier anthologies and see if it's nicer mm -hmm. about one of them. In the case where there are new volumes, do you ever have any comment on what sort of quality is evidence mm -hmm. that there's a lot of copying of those new ones or interesting or interesting? Well, uh, uh, um, the short answer is that before the 19th century, there's virtually nobody whose complete divans we have. I have heard of divans by these poets, but I haven't been able to get hold of them. And I have a feeling they're still in manuscript, and who knows where the manuscripts are. Jahan, Jahan Khatun is a special case. She was a princess, uh, and she, I, I presume as a princess, she arranged for her poems to be copied. There are two complete copies of her poems, uh, and which are almost indistinguishable. There are very slight differences between the two, and they seem to be in the same hand. They seem to be done by the same copyist. And there are two partial copies, uh, who seem to be done by, which seem to be done by different copies, um, of Jahan Khatun's, um, divan. There is, a, the, the poet Mehri, um, uh, the, the, the one, um, who's rather bawdy, who's fed up with her, her older husband. I have read that her divan exists, but I haven't been able to find it. And certainly interlibrary loan knows nothing about it. So my, <laughs> my feeling is it's in manuscript somewhere, but I, I haven't seen it. Once you get to the 19th century, things change. Uh, and, and then there, there are divans. Yeah. Yes? That's a very good question. The question, if, if some of you didn't hear it, was that do these women poets pay attention to, to women poets who precede them? Uh, are, are they aware of these poets who precede them? And the answer is that many of them do. Jahan Khatun, for example, she's one of the very few poets whose divan is prefaced by a preface which she wrote. She writes this preface herself. And the preface is quite revealing. Uh, um, she says that she didn't write poetry for a long time for two reasons. One was that women don't write poetry, and the other was that she thought she didn't have enough talent. She asks people to, I, it's, it's a kind of modesty topos. It's the opposite to the male poets who all, all boast about what great poets they are. She says, I'm, I'm, I'm not that good a poet. Please forgive me. And she's a fabulous poet. She's a really terrific poet. Um, it, certainly in her best poems, she is. Uh, but Jahan Khatun then says, I thought women didn't do this. And then I found, and she lists, I think, three Arabic poets and four Persian women poets. She said, I found these women poets did it, so I thought I would. The poet Mahfi, the last poet I read, there is a later Mahfi called Mahfi of Badakhshan. Uh, and Mahfi of Badakhshan says in one of her poems, this poem is to the Mahfi of Hindi, the Indian Mahfi. That is, she, she calls herself Mahfi because she admires the Indian Mahfi. There's a, a late 19th century poet, I can't remember her name now, who says, um, I, I mentioned that poet, uh, Masati, the, the poem I read at the very beginning, she can't be kept locked up. She says, I am the Masati of my age. I am the Masati of my time. So a number of these women poets, they were aware of, of, of a kind of lineage of women poets preceding them. And you can see also that they're not just aware of the lineage, but they're aware of the specialness of it and the particularness of it. And that they are in that, in that, and they're proud to be in that line. Yeah. <coughs> I never thought of that. Um, what makes you think that? You mentioned that actually after her husband's death, Bahashat had this... Uh, yes, all, all female court. All female it was thought to be all female. And the badliness in Mary's poetry, it's, it's as if she feels comfortable talking to female audience. That's certainly true. Those poems are certainly written for a female audience, yeah. Um, it may be that she was a sort of licensed, jokey poet. Yes, that's a nice idea. I hadn't thought of it, but I, I'll go along with it. <laughs> yes? Uh, other than writing about love or both of their children or the ruthlessness of their old husband, mm. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, like, do these uh, poets go into, say, more societal or cultural issues as well in their poetry or not? That's a good question. Um, you see hints of it now and again. You see hints of it in Jahan Khatun's poetry. Jahan Khatun has all those poems about the political upheaval that happened halfway through her life when, you know, her family were killed off. So she has poems about politics in that way. But women poets become conscious of society and of their own position in society around the middle of the 19th century. And at that moment, you get a lot of poets and that becomes their main subject. And there's a very strange dynamic happens then because the, the end of the 19th century, towards the constitutional revolution in Iran at the beginning of the 20th century, there's a great, the, to, to begin with, newspapers begin to, pub, to be published. There's much more, and the newspapers would publish some of these women's poet, poems. There's, there's a lot more literacy in the country, uh, and there's a, there's a kind of consciousness that, that society is changing. And women poets contribute to this. There are many very patriotic poems by women poets at the end of the 19th century. Uh, and they're often patriotic poems reproaching men, saying, why don't you get off your behind and fight? Uh, there's a lot of that. Um, but there's a kind of paradox in those poems, it, 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 which is really interesting, which I, I, it needs unpiecing by somebody. These poets at the end of the 19th century, they demand two things, which in many ways seem contradictory or to go against each other. One is they say, they actually mention Europe. They say, why can't we be free like, like women in Europe? We want to be, we want to have the same, um, of course they have a fantasy of what Europe's like. Um, we want, we want to be free like European women. We, we want to, we want to choose our own husbands, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we want to be in control of our own money and so on and so forth. As I say, it's a fantasy of European life, but it's, 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 it's strong. They often mention Europe. At the same time, they are saying, that they, that they are saying, we want to be like Europe. They are saying, we want Europe completely out of our country. So they are, they are both turning against Europe and saying, please, can we be like Europe? There's a, there's a real strange tension there. And it seems to be almost unconscious. There's a sense that the future will bring both those things, although they, they, they don't seem really to fit together. And that, that, there's a number of poets who, who write in that way. Yeah? Uh, how about like, their perceptions or like, their interactions or relationships with uh, earlier male poets? Yeah, you, you, you do get poets, um, uh, yeah, they're, they're very conscious of the, of the kind of canon of Persian poetry. But Persian poetry, really from Jami on, from the, from the 15th century on, or even earlier, it's very intertextual. People are very aware of the poets who've gone before. They quote the poets. They, they use lines from them to, to, to sort of riff off their own poems on them. Uh, and they, they take part in that too. Although sometimes you get the sense that Perhaps they, they don't they don't have access to the number of, of, of books that, that the male counterparts do, but they're, they're still aware of, of 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 previous poetry. And some poets actually refer to um, Jahan Khatun, for example, refers to Saadi. She says Sheikh Saadi in one of her poems, and she says she wants to write like Saadi, which is interesting because Saadi is a hundred years before her, and in fact her poems are more like Saadi's than they are like Hafez's, although Hafez was her contemporary. They have that kind of limpidity and clarity that Saadi has, and they don't have that complexity that Hafez has. Um, Jahan Khatun talks about one thing at a time. Hafez talks about six things at a time, so, or three. <laughs> should, we, should we leave it at that? Thank you. Well, if there are no further questions, I would like to thank uh, Professor Davis for the attention to uh, poetry and the love for it, as well as the recovery of female poets' voices, which were subjects that were indeed close to the heart and the practice as translator and scholar of Professor Moyad, mm. particularly with respect to his edition of translation of and holding of the first academic conference here in 1989 on the modern poet Irina Kasami. Yeah. So mm. it was an extremely appropriate uh, lecture Thank for you. the occasion, and it was most engaging. And Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.